All right, in this video, we're going to be looking at several algebraic equations, and we're gonna go through the processes to figure out uh, what kind of equation is it, and how do we solve it. So let's start with this one right here. We have two fractions that are equal to each other. So that's probably going to be the first thing that stands out to you is the fact that we have two fractions. Now, I know a lot of you don't like fractions, so let's talk about what we can do with those fractions. So one of the things we need to remember is this is that if you have a fraction equal to a fraction, that means we have a proportion, and in a proportion, cross products are going to be equal. So that means the product of a times d is going to equal the other cross product, and that's going to be the product of b times c. Okay, so what this allows us to do is that it allows us to take this equation with fractions and we rewrite it so that we don't have fractions. And that's a pretty simple problem after that. So based on what you see right here, that means we're gonna look at this cross product. This cross product, which includes the factors nine times five minus three X. And then we have the other cross product and that is four times x plus seven. So very quickly, we go from having fractions to not having fractions. And now we just need to take what we have here on each side of the equation, multiply it out, and as, you know, reassess the equation to see what kind of equation we have. So over here when I distribute, we have 45 minus 27x, and on the right side we distribute the four, and that's 4x plus 28. Okay, So once we distribute, we see that, well, in terms of the variables, it's just x to the first power, so that means we have something that is a linear. And if we have something that's linear, then we solve it like any other linear equation. We get variables on one side, we get constants on the other side, and it really doesn't matter which way you go. Now, for me, um, you know, I'm always going to move my variable terms first, and I'm going to move them in such a way that I have a positive coefficient whenever I'm done. So, even though I can move this 4x to the left, that's going to give me a negative coefficient, so I tend not to do that. Instead, I'm going to move the 27x to the other side by adding 27x. So it gives me 0 on the left, uh, with a negative 27 and plus 27. So now we just have 45 equals combined like terms, that's 31x plus 28. And now, get the variables to the other side by subtracting 28. That gives me 0. Subtract 28 over here. And this gives me 17. So 17 equals 31x. And then one last step to get x by itself, and that's to divide both sides here by 31. So that gives me 17 over 31 is equal to x. Um, if you don't like having x on the right side of the equation, do know that this is the same thing as saying that x is equal to 17 over 31. Those guys mean the exact same thing. And in fact, if you had moved this 4x to the left side instead of moving the 27 to the right side, uh, you would have had the exact same answer. There would have been an extra step for you. There would have been an extra negative for you to deal with. So that's why I tend to move my terms so that I have a positive lead coefficient. It just makes things easier in the long run. Now, that's not the only way that we could have done this problem. Problem. It's not the only way to get rid of the fractions. Uh, I just want to show this to you real quick. So let me rewrite this for you. So another way of tackling a problem like this when you have a bunch of fractions is to identify the LCD. So if we can identify the LCD, we can multiply everything in the equation by that LCD, and uh, we should not have any denominators left after that. So if you look here between 4 and 9, the LCD is 36. So if I multiply the left side of the equation by 36, that means I have to multiply the right side of the equation by 36 as well. And let's make sure we understand that's 36 over 1. 
So when we do that, before I multiply and get really big nasty numbers, I'm going to look to simplify. And that's the whole point of multiplying times the LCD. So here, 4 goes into 36 9 times, and 9 goes into 36 4 times. And so what you see in our next step is that we have 9 that's going to distribute to the 5 minus 3x on the left. And on the right side, you've got the 4 that's going to have to distribute to the x plus 7. And you see that's the same thing that we had here once we did the cross products. So more than one way to do the same problem, you still get the same answer. All right, let's look at the next one. So the next equation for us is 3x squared plus 10 equals 11x. All right, so at first glance, we see that there are no fractions, no radicals, nothing really weird about the ordinary. I do see x squared. I see an x term and I see a constant. So in my mind, I'm going, this is quadratic. In order for me to solve an equation that's quadratic, I should first get everything on the same side of the equation. It just kind of makes sense that way. It's a lot easier for us to evaluate and figure out what we need to do here. So let's subtract 11x on both sides. Make sure that you write your terms in descending order. So 3x squared minus 11x plus 10 equals 0. All right, so let's talk about the progression that we have for solving a quadratic equation. And when I say progression, I'm talking about the methods that we have, starting from the easiest going to, you know, I'm not going to say increasing difficulty, but based on what you see in the equation, it kind of tells you the best way to proceed. So if you can, the first thing that you would try to use is the square root property. Uh, now this is only going to be good if you have just one instance of the variable and that guy is a square or it's contained inside of a square. So I've got x squared here, but I also have an x term here. So that means the square root property does not apply right now. The next thing that we try is to factor and use the zero factor theorem. All right, so to figure out if this is something that can factor, um, well, we're gonna have to see if it'll factor. Right? We're just gonna have to go through the motions and see what works. So when I look at this, I see that I have a lead coefficient that is not one, so I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of uh, scratch work here. So for the zero factor theorem, I would do the AC method. So A times C is three times 10, which gives me 30. And then with the 30, I'm trying to find factors of 30. So I wanna multiply to get 30, and I want those factors to add to 11. So if you can find a combination, if you can find a pair of factors for 30 that will satisfy that statement, then you know that you can factor this. But if there are no factor pairs of 30 that add to 11, it doesn't factor and you'd have to try another method. But we see here that if I look at 30 as five times six, five times six will multiply to give me 30 and those numbers will add to give me 11. So that's exactly what I wanna do. So I'm now going to rewrite this minus 11x using the 5x and the 6x from here. So I'm going to say 5x and 6x. So I'm rewriting 11x to be as 5 and 6. And we've got to pay attention to our signs. Uh, how would you use a 5 and a 6 to get a negative 11 when you combine? Well, that's when both of those guys are negative. So you see here that the negative 11x is the same as saying negative 5x minus 6x. It's the exact same thing. I just kind of rewrote that. That's like taking a $20 bill and exchanging that for, say, a $10 bill and two $5 bills. It's still the same thing. It just looks different. But the reason we split up the middle term is so that we can factor by grouping. We have four terms, so we create our pairs for groups. So here... In this first group, I identify the common factor here, which is x. Factor that out, and I am left with 3x minus 5. In the second group, which begins with a minus, so that's going to be a negative right here, the common factor for 6x and 10 is 2. So I'm going to be factoring out or dividing out the negative 2, which gives me 3x minus 5, which is exactly what we expect to happen, because if we're going to factor by grouping, we need these right here to be exactly the same. 
Since they are, we finish the factor by grouping by writing 3x minus 5 out in front. And that 3x minus 5 is being multiplied times x minus 2. Don't forget that you have an equation, so that product is equal to 0. And now we actually get to use the zero factor theorem. So when you have a product that equals zero, you then take each factor and you set them equal to zero. So 3x minus 5 equals zero, or x minus 2 equals zero. So you create smaller equations, easier equations to solve. So here, add the 5 on both sides, so 3x equals 5, divide both sides by 3, and x equals 5 thirds. Over here, add 2 to the other side, and we just get x equals 2. We have two solutions, and we expected to have two solutions because we had an equation that had a degree of 2. It was x squared. All right, so this one wasn't too bad. It was quadratic. We got everything to the same side of the equation, and we went through the progression. We couldn't use the square root property, we tried factoring and we were able to find a combination that was going to work. So we factored. All right, let's see what we have next. So here is this equation. 2 plus 5 times the quantity of 2x plus 13 squared equals 37. It sounds like a lot, but let's look at this for a moment. Uh, we if we pay attention, we recognize that there is only one instance of the variable, and it's right there. It's the only time we see x. And not only that, it's stuck inside of something that's a square. So this is something that's great for using the square root property. But the thing is, we can't actually use the square root property until we get the square by itself. So we've got to get rid of the 2 and the 5 so that all that remains on the left side here is the square. Now, I'm going to caution you here, because I have seen students a lot of times in the past take 2 and 5 and try to add those guys, but you must remember that 5 is connected to that set of parentheses through multiplication, so you can't do 2 plus 5. You can't do addition before multiplication takes place. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract the 2 on both sides. This is the first step in getting that square by itself. So we have 5 times the quantity 2x plus 13 squared is equal to 35. We're not ready to use the square root property yet because the square is not by itself. You still have that number out in front, the 5, so we need to get rid of that. Again, since this is multiplication, we're going to do the inverse operation, which is to divide both sides by 5, just like this. And so now we have 2x plus 13 squared equals 7. So before we can get to the to the juicy inside piece there where the x is, we've got to get rid of the square. So the way we undo the square is we use the square root property. So let's take the square root of both sides and remember that when you are the one who is applying the square root, you must also remember the plus or minus right here. All right. So now, when you take the square root of the square, you have just the stuff on the inside here. So 2x plus 13 is equal to plus or minus. You try to simplify the square root of 7 as best you can, but there are no factors that are perfect squares, so you leave it as the square root of 7. All right, so now, just pretend you don't even have anything on the right side. You're trying to get x by itself, so you think about the steps you would take to get x by itself which means you've got to get rid of the 13 and the 2. So there's something already on the other side, but that's okay. Subtract 13, and if you already have a plus or minus in place whenever you are uh, trying to get x by itself, anything that you move to the other side really should go in front of that. So let's write this as negative 13, and then plus or minus the square root of 7. Let's be very clear about what the plus or minus is connected to and it's just the square root of 7. And then, divide both sides by 2. So x is equal to negative 13 plus or minus the square root of 7, and all of this is divided by 2. 
Now, you might try to do more simplifying here, but again, you've got a radical. And so anytime you have something that's a radical or even something that's imaginary here at the end with a plus or minus, there's really not gonna be anything else that you can do here. Uh, the most you could do is to see if there's a common factor for all three of these pieces, but there's not. So this is all that we need to write. There is no need to try to split this up. There's no need to say one with the plus and one with the minus because look at this. If I cover that up and I have negative 13 plus the square root of seven, those guys can't go together. They're not like terms. So doing one plus and one minus doesn't allow you to do anything extra with that. So that's it, not too bad. So we recognized up here that this was the only variable. It was contained inside of a square, so this was a square root property type problem. All right, let's see what we have down here. All right, so we have another equation, and it seems to be pretty normal. You don't have any weird stuff. You don't have radicals. You don't have fractions. You just have something that's a polynomial. So typically, when you have an equation that's a polynomial, you want everything to be on the same side. You want to have zero on the other side. And one of the first things you try to do is factor. Okay, So here, I've got four terms. And I know that when it comes to four terms and factoring, I should factor by grouping. So I'm going to take this first group. And I can identify that the common factor between those guys is x squared. So factor that out. I would have 5x plus 6. And then in my second group, I start with a plus. The common factor for these two terms is 3. Factor that out, and I have 5x plus 6 left over. All right. And since these guys are exactly the same, we can now finish our factoring by grouping. So the 5x plus 6 is going to come out front. And that's going to be connected to the x squared plus 3. This whole guy is equal to 0. All right, so we factored. Great. And the reason we factor is so that we can use the zero factor theorem. So we're going to take each factor, and we're going to set them equal to 0, just like we did earlier in this video. So 5x plus 6 is equal to 0, or x squared plus 3 is equal to 0. So you take an equation that had degree 3, and you split it up into something that's more manageable. You got this guy right here, which is degree 1, a nice linear equation, and this guy is degree 2, so he's quadratics, and we know how to deal with quadratic equations. So here, the first thing you're going to do is subtract 6, so 5x equals negative 6, and then x equals negative 6 over 5. Okay, nice and easy. So that's one solution, but if you look up here, we were expecting to have three solutions. So where did we get the other two from? Well, we get them from the quadratic factor, x squared plus 3 equals 0. So we move the 3 to the other side, so that's negative 3. And then we use the square root property, right? That's how we get rid of the square. So take the square root of both sides. Don't forget the plus or minus. So this gives us x is equal to plus or minus, and now we try to take care of the square root of negative 3. Well, the only thing that we can do here is to handle the negative right? And the reason we can only deal with the negative is because 3 is a prime number. So you can't factor that out. You can't find a square that's a perfect, or you can't find a perfect square that's a factor of 3. So he's going to stay inside. And the only thing that reduces is the i comes out in front of the square root of 3. So here's one answer. The plus or minus will give us our two other answers. One answer is real. Two answers are imaginary, but you have a total of three solutions to this equation. All right? Hope that helps.